All right. Welcome back to the Fruit Snacks podcast. I almost said the Believe You Are a Good Mom podcast because that's what this podcast used to be called. And that is what this conversation is going to be about. So I have a super special guest today named Kurt Frankham. He is, I have an official title for you here. Is this correct? (laughs) He's the executive director of Leading Saints. Is that right? That's right. Executive, super executive director. So executive. (laughs) And the Leading Saints podcast is one of my favorites that I, you know, frequent. And so I've been a huge fan and follower for a long time. So this is a treat for me. Oh, good. I, I really appreciate that. Um, okay. So Kurt just wrote a book, which I was not at all surprised by what it was called or what the content was. Cause I feel like I've been on this journey with you as you've been writing it. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Listening to all the episodes and hearing your thoughts about this. Um, but it was really fun to binge it last week, <laughs> binge oh, listen to it and, um, get it all kind of in a fire hose. So, yeah. um, your book is called, is God disappointed in me? That's right. That's so, right. And the subtitle is removing shame from a gospel of grace. So, yes, I'm so excited about that. Cause I'm so, I don't like to say anti-shame cause anti sounds so bad, <laughs> but yeah. I definitely do a lot of thinking and coaching and, you know, shame work. Right. Yeah. So, it's everywhere. I think one person called it, uh, it's like glitter. It's shame glitter. Mm-hmm. It's everywhere. You can't get rid of it. The more you try and get rid of it, the more it shows up. It's crazy. Yeah. Glitter on the dresses when you're vacuuming Uh the pews. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Every member a janitor cleaning up glitter. Okay. So God, is he disappointed in us? Let's just clear the air right now. No, I mean, I could, it could be a one page or one word book. No, he's, he's never been disappointed in all of us. And for some people that's kind of uh, shocking to hear. You almost, you have to sit with it a little bit. Like, what do you mean? He's, I mean, I, I felt uh, his disappointment before. So how, how does this work? Right. Yeah. And the reason we think that God is disappointed in us is because we have mortal parents who were disappointed in us. <laughs> and yeah. so we project our feelings about our mortal parents onto our eternal parents. And um, that right there is a thought error. That's right. right. Yeah. Just like anything, you know, as we discover new things in life, we often need a model or something to compare it to in order to understand it. And so obviously we learn about and 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 develop a relationship with our parents first before we really understand what God is or who God is and developing that relationship. So it's very typical to um, project our assumptions of what our parents are onto God and assume he is the same way when that can lead to um, some, some danger in some areas and other areas. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I was coaching someone last, just last week where she was saying that she wants to be this kind of parent, but she kind of, you know, how we open our mouths and our moms come out. Right. So (laughs) she was like, I'm being a little too authoritarian. Like my dad raised me and Well, first of all, I just love coaching so much because I just listen to people until the Holy Ghost tells me what to say. And then brilliance comes out of my mouth (laughs) and I'm like, whoa, this is fun to like be an instrument. Right. And so what I shared with her that I just thought was like so good, I knew it didn't come from me. Um, Yes, she has the DNA from her father in her. So, of course, she's going to do what the recorded tapes in her head are from Mm -hmm. the way she was raised. But she also has a celestial father and she has that DNA in her also. And we just need to tap into that instead of the default programming that we got from our parents. Yeah. Yeah. And and you just have to be, be aware of this, right. Have um, uh, awareness that these dynamics are happening and sometimes uh, they can lead to unintended shame. um, And this is where the adversary gets us. Exactly. So this is kind of how I see it. When we were in nursery and primary, we learned I am a child of God, right? Mm -hmm. So we took that on as our identity. We believed it really easily because we're really close to the veil. Right. And we know of our identity. So I really want to talk about this identity thing because I've been geeking out on identity stuff for a couple of years now. And it's really where I've seen the most improvement in my behaviors, right, is by focusing on my identity instead of on my behaviors. So the way I kind of see it is like, we believe it. Yeah, yeah, I'm a child of God until we start making mistakes. (laughs) So some of us even believed it through young women's, I'm a beloved daughter of heavenly parents, you know, Mm -hmm. and we believed it until we start making mistakes, right? And so, and I like how you kind of articulate that in your book too, that in the youth years, when you start, you know, the shame kicks in once there's mistakes and that's the confusion that we have. So can you kind of clarify that for us? 
Yeah. So, and, and, you know, the, this is the power of shame is that often, um, there is a, um, you know, it's not so much that we identify as something bad, but that we identify as, as something that, that used to be good. And that's where a lot of the shame comes in. Like, oh, when I was little, I was a child of God. Now I've ruined that. Now I'm not wanted by God now, or I'm unacceptable, or he's, uh, you know, disappointed me. He's shaking his head. He's uh, almost disgusted with me that I'm, I'm making such decisions. And this just perpetuates a spiral of, of shame, which leads to more and more bad decisions. Yeah, exactly. So, so I kind of feel like, and you did this in your book a lot too. The examples were either porn or being a bad mom. <laughs> so it's <laughs> the like, two plagues of the world. You know? Exactly. No. <laughs> and so that's why I like my platform is believe you are a good mom because uh -huh. we are good. God said we are good. He created us and said it is good. Right. Yeah. And so we are inherently good and we're mortals that make mistakes and do a bunch of bad stuff. You know, uh -huh. we put moral judgment on all of our actions, but we are good. And so when I started focusing on that and believing that, then it was like, yeah, I still did some things that aren't in alignment with my true self, but I didn't beat myself up for them as much. Didn't spiral into that shame spiral when I remembered who I was, who I truly am. And so, um, do you got anything to say about that before yeah, I yeah. on a little bit more? <laughs> No, I'm happy to insert here. So, and this is, and it's funny, you know, it's that dichotomy, either porn or being a bad mom. And and I maybe should have consulted that. That's sort of my personal perspective of, you know, usually a lot of men are dealing with porn. That's sort of the stigma, even though there's some women that deal with that. And a lot of women struggle with being, being satisfied as, as a mother, even though some many fathers, including myself struggle with parenting and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but I think there's just this unique, especially, you know, when we're talking in 2024, when it comes to shame, like the cards can feel stacked against us. And, and you know, again, I can't speak for uh, all mothers, but this is just, again, my perception of just seeing my wife live in this world of trying to, uh, striving to be a great mother. But, you know, we go to, it's even in the little things, right? We go to Instagram and we're just scrolling in a, in a passive sort of just, sort of just, I'm just unwinding and seeing, you know, checking with friends and their posts or influencers. And then we come across that picture of, you know, the family standing outside of church or outside the temple. And, and from that one moment, it looks like, oh, they, they figured it out. They cracked the code. And for some reason I'm struggling, but they're not. And, you know, the comparison game just adds gasoline to the fire of, of that shame. And then it suddenly feels like, oh, I'm not living up to the standard. And I expected so much more from me. And I bet God even expected even more from me. And that's, you know, the shame game, uh, the yeah. spiral just continues. Yeah. And so really like the thought that has really jiggled my brain on this, but mm -hmm. I really want to believe it is that our worth does not come from our works. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so positive or negative, like we think, oh yeah, we're doing so great because we're doing positive things. And then, oh no, we are so terrible because we're doing negative things, but really like our worth just is. And it's actually really funny because that's what they teach us. Right. I know. Right. In primary and young women's. But then all of a sudden we forget that when we become moms and we start yelling at our kids and all of a sudden we're just a terrible person, you know? Right, right. And it was like, if we could make it unscathed at least this far, then like motherhood just hits us in the face. Cause it's so hard. And all of a sudden we become <laughs> this like monster that we never were before. We used to be like a nice little Molly Mormon who like yeah. followed all the rules and did everything yeah. right. But that's yeah, the I, whole point, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw a funny meme online yesterday. You know, the the first started out like the the mother we thought we would be, and it shows you know uh, Julie Andrews in in so Sound of Music, where mm -hmm. she's sitting with the kids and singing with them, and it's beautiful. And then it switches to the mother I actually am, and it's Judge Judy. You know, like oh, right. yelling at people, condemning them. <laughs> Uh -huh. threatening them and, and so forth. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there, we sort of wake up one day in these adult bodies and we think, dang, like, I thought this would go much better than it's going. And, it, and it's not. And, um, and this is, you know, in your coaching work, I imagine this, because this is really, this, this book really is an exercise of thought work. Like, do I know, like, absolutely that God's never been disappointed in me. I mean, maybe I'll get to the other side after I pass on. And uh, the first thing God will say to me is like, Hey, Kurt, cute book that you wrote, but man, not I was totally wrong. disappointed in you. Right. But <laughs> in the moment, whether that's true or not, it doesn't really serve me well. Right. Yeah. So you might as well try on these thoughts of like, what if my works don't lead to any worthiness or what if he really isn't 
isn't disappointed in me and he's just encouraging just walk around like give that a no. six week try or a, a six hour try if that's all you can do and it's remarkable the grace you feel and then suddenly you're able to give grace to other people like exactly. you can just push through some of these discouragements because you know that you were never supposed to be perfect so why are you striving and reaching for that and w- without um the, the help of the savior who his works were sufficient he did enough all things he did like it's done. The game is over, but we keep playing the game. Yeah, exactly. So that's the whole entire point, right? Is that yeah. like, it's supposed to be too hard for us to do by ourselves. And so as our works are good enough that we feel worthy enough, then we're fine. But then when, oh, wait, actually we do need a savior. And it wasn't the backup plan. It is the plan. And, um, and that's when we really kind of have to develop that relationship yeah. with him. And yeah, I posed the question in the book about, um, you know, if you were to meet the savior today and he was to say, how can I heal you? What, what is there that I can heal? Like, yeah. would you have an answer for that? Now there's some days as a mother, a parent, or as a human being where it's like, oh, I have a list for you of things that you can heal and address. And other days when things are going good, we, we sometimes convince ourselves like, oh, I'm doing pretty good. Like I'm keeping up on all my all my things, you know, the, the churchy things, the, the housework and wow, everything's going great. Like, I think I've got it. I've got it figured out. Like we may have those days, but if we can't turn to the savior and articulate how we can be healed, then why do we need a savior? Yeah. And so that, uh, that's a question I hope people really sit with. Cause there, I admit there are days where I'm like, oh, well, yeah, things are going pretty good. But so why do I need a savior today? I mean, I need them in the eternities, but why today? And so that that leads me to really lean into that relationship and check myself and making sure that I'm not resting on my own laurels uh, as as I'm going through the day, checking all the boxes. Yeah. Yeah. Because when we're like, oh, I guess we're supposed to do daily repentance, but I didn't really mess up on anything today. Like, yeah, then we're kind of probably relying on our own strength. And the point of the repentance is to turn towards the Savior. So how much did I actually even think about Jesus today? Maybe right. I do have some repenting to do after all, right? <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. But as far as grace goes, I just found this really awesome quote that I wanted to bring up. Um, it's actually Brad Wilcox's article in the new, whatever they call these now, for the strength of youth. Oh, yeah. The youth magazine. Mm-hmm. And so he says, in other words, people feel less shame and more self-esteem when they understand that grace is available right here and now, not after we earn it or deserve it. When we know that God helps no matter what we have done or how many times we feel we have let him down. We feel inspired to keep trying. Yeah. So we feel we've let him down because we make it mean that we've let ourselves down. We let our parents down. We let the neighbors down. We let God down, you know, like that's just a natural human thought that we have. But if you're right and God's not disappointed, (laughs) then the point is that like, we can never earn it or deserve it. You know, grace is just a free gift that he gives us that he's happy to let us use over and over and over and over. And we want to, you know, believe satan's lies that lo- nope there's a limit on that like you've already used that grace a little too much today like uh-huh. you need to beat yourself <laughs> up now enough with this grace thing right. right yeah this there's this weird wiring in our brain for some reason like that there needs to be some level of suffering on our end if things aren't going well right or if it's too easy and this is like the false dichotomy that people paint with grace is well, if we believe too much in grace, I mean, are we really going to be motivated to to do anything? They almost want this angry God that's chasing mm-hmm. them, you know, mm-hmm. with the key to hell. Like if you don't, if you don't run faster, I'm going to lock you up forever in the, you know, in the brimstone, right? It's like, whoa, like, okay, I can see how that's very motivating, but that's not very sanctifying. Like it, that doesn't cause me to want to be like him. I don't, I don't dream right. of, of developing into this figure who's just angry all the time to, to scare people into compliance. And so, um, yeah, we just have to embrace that grace and, and, uh, it's, it's always there. And, and, you know, Brad Wilcox has been so masterful at unpacking these dynamics mm-hmm. of that. This isn't some like mortal race that we're in just dragging ourselves through blood, sweat, and tears and doing all that we can so that someday in the far eternities, we'll get to a point where, you know, where Jesus bops us on the head with his, his grace wand and suddenly everything's taken care of. Like, no, it's like every single day, every single moment, God is never disappointed in you because he's right there just cheering you on, knowing that the, again, the game is over. Like the scoreboard is set. Yeah. So, um, as far as parenting goes, 
it's kind of grace parenting versus shame parenting, right? And now that we're all so enlightened about what shame is and that we shouldn't shame our children, even though we're programmed to because we were parented that way, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's yeah. kind of tricky because we open our mouth and, you know. Um, yeah. yeah, The, I forget where I was going with that. But um, shaming, okay, let me just go here then. Oh, no, no, I remember, sorry. <laughs> okay. <good>. Um. <clears throat> Okay. Cause it was, again, I was coaching someone just yesterday where she felt like if it was, it was like easy. She's like, I feel like I'm addicted to the hard. Like when I have an easy day, then I make that a problem. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so I was like, why do you think that is? And we kind of dug out this, the way we're parented, like with sticker charts and things like that, we feel like we need to earn approval. Right. right. And God doesn't work that way. Like there's no celestial sticker charts. We're not earning approval when we, you know, tinkle on the potty instead of have an accident, like we just always are a hundred percent loved and accepted and approved. Yeah. And he understands that he put us here in this situation where we're mortals and we're going to mess up. That's the whole point. And he's ready and willing to, to give us that grace, but it's counterintuitive because it's not the way we were raised necessarily. Yeah. So yeah, how and, do we take that and raise our kids differently is what I want to ask. Yeah. Okay. So there's, <clears throat> this is a great question. Um, it's actually one that somebody asked me yesterday and, and I addressed it a little bit in the book, <clears throat> excuse me, about, uh, you know, well, if God's never been disappointed, but then why am I disappointed in my kids a lot, you mm -hmm. know, and, or if God doesn't hold or these in ourselves, yeah, or in ourselves, right. Or if God doesn't hold the, these expectations for us. Why do I hold expectations of myself or in others? And, um, and it's one of those things like, you know, going back to feelings, like if someone was afraid, right? Like there's nothing wrong with being afraid, even though it's one of the most oft repeated commandments of, yeah. you know, be not afraid, right? Mm -hmm. God has commanded you not be afraid and you're afraid, right? And then that's where sort of shame can enter in or, you know, God's told you to accept his grace, but, uh, you're, you're, why are you disappointed? You know, what's the problem? So we, we sort of cast the shame back on us when we're like, oh no, like I'm being the disappointed parent. Now, what do I do with that? And one, I mean, this is where you're coaching others come in is, uh, you know, just like feel it, just like be in that moment. There's nothing wrong with feeling afraid. There's right. nothing wrong with feeling disappointed. It's a moment that for you to just sit and accept that, oh yeah, you're a human being, you're immortal. Like just because God is God doesn't mean you have to be God. <laughs> like right. he, he is, he is uh, beyond measure of anything you are. So of course, just because he's not disappointed doesn't mean that you can't be disappointed. Mm -hmm. So just, just recognize it for what it is and give yourself a lot of grace. Mm -hmm. And, but this is the beauty of this principle is as you strive to move forward in a life where you, uh, begin to believe that God isn't disappointing you, you feel that grace come into your, into your life. The more you receive that grace into your life, you're more you're, the more you'll be able to give grace to others because you become sanctified. You've you've become a new creature through that grace of Jesus Christ. This is why it's often, um, often articulated that grace is the enabling power mm -hmm. of the atonement of Jesus Christ. It's as if when you receive grace, it flips a switch on in you. Now, again, some some days are better than others, and some days it's easier to give grace than others. But as a parent, it's okay to feel disappointed. And it's just like, it's okay to feel afraid, but just know that maybe this is a moment you can step back and seek for more grace. Maybe you, you've you somehow clouded your vision and uh, you've gotten back in some, some old habits of blocking this grace of Jesus Christ. So just recognize it, take a deep breath, accept that you're human and seek grace for yourself. And then what you'll, you'll find that, oh, there's so much more grace that you can give your, your family, your children, your, your spouse. And whatnot. Yeah. Yeah, that's so beautiful. So um, I have a a question about sibling rivalry and Ooh, not um, right. shaming parenting, right? Because <laughs> I actually really enjoyed your vulnerability and sharing some of the struggles that you've had growing up, you know? Mm -hmm. And as I dig things out, I mean, just today I was getting coached on randomness and then I'm like, no, the rub really isn't comparing myself to my sister and my mom. Like uh -huh. it still is there. Like the sibling rivalry is real, right? Like just the way we interpret things. And so as a parent, of course, I want to keep my children from having this terrible experience. Mm -hmm. And so I want them all to know that I love them all and accept them all and whatever, but just our mortal minds and the way we make things up, it's like, there's no way they're coming out unscathed, 
right? Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know right. if you have any thoughts about like, oh yeah. So well, yeah, what could book... your mom have done different to help you <laughs> not feel that way or something? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, talking in the book about my personal story, I'm the youngest of four, uh, two older brothers and an older sister, the brother right directly or three years older than me. Uh, he was sort of the one I was always right behind, you know, chasing as he was going into high school, I was going into junior high as he was, you know, uh, leaving high school, I was entering high school. And so I was always felt like I was sort of keeping up with this Frankum reputation. Mm -hmm. Right. And he was uh, an incredibly good student, um, valedictorian, straight A's, full right scholarships, all the things. And here I am just like, just, just praying for B's and C's. Right. <laughs> um, and so it created a dynamic. That's where the shame came in. Like, oh, I, th I, I began to create expectations that my parents didn't necessarily have, but I created in my own mind. Yeah. And of course, you know, again, my parents were mortal too. There was moments where, yeah, there was shame there and um, expectations were uh, a little bit too heavy, things like that. Um, the, um, the, oh, the, let me, let me get back on track here. Um, so the, the point, uh, so one, one, I'll give like a tactic and not that this is like the end all tactic, but maybe parents can sit with this. Um, I've had moments in my life where I talk about one in particular in the book where I felt a, a extreme, a, a strong communication from God telling me that I could never read my scriptures again and he'd still love me, or I could never keep the commandments again, and he'd still love me. I could be a sinner the rest of my life, and he could still love me, right? As parents, we sort of get in this mode. We feel a lot of pressure. Um, you know, there's a lot of influences at school and life and wherever. And so we we want to like triple down on some of the expectations, right? Like, mm -hmm. hey, in this house, we we do homework, you know, or in this house, you know, we, we go to college. So if you better get your act together in the A, B, and C class or whatever. And now these are, these are fine. You know, I talk about God as the eternal coach and we should, uh, you know, obviously you're literally a coach, right? Like we need coaches in our lives that are, can look at us and say, listen, like things have got to change if you're going to, um, if you're if you're going to head down this path that, that you want to head down, right? Like those are appropriate moments. However, they need to be done with a foundation of love and acceptance and grace. And oftentimes we sort of just touch on that and move on. Like, yeah, yeah. of course I love you, but hey, let's get that let's get those uh, that homework done. Or yeah, I love you, but man, it's really important that you go to college. So let's get the, those college applications out, right? Yeah, I think it's really crucial as parents we have these moments of uh, two things come to mind. One, the power of a parent uh, apologizing to a child. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've talked to grown adults who um, are decades away from their childhood years, asking them if, they're, if their parent ever apologized to them, and it brings them to tears because they never heard that apology, let alone maybe an I love you, you know, that could be powerful, but even this moment of, of apology because parents... Uh, can parents mess up, right? And mm -hmm. and I've had some of the sweetest moments with my children as I've had a rough day. Maybe I've responded with more shame, more disappointment than I should. And to go to their bedside at night and just uh, take a quiet moment and say, hey, I didn't respond well to that. You know, I, I apologize. I just want you to know I love you. And then here's the, the, the powerful tactic. Instead of um, articulating some expectations, articulate more the grace that you have and using just that, that, that framing. Hey, I just want you to know, like you could never do your homework again. You could always be late and I'd still love you. Like that stuff really doesn't matter. I just want to help you. And if, if that's helpful, but let's go to that, that foundation. Like you are completely loved by me. Even if you, if you rebel or, you know, you take a different path in life, like you will always find love in this home and acceptance. And this is the paradox of it. You know, Carl Rod Rogers, a, a psychologist, um, framed it that uh, the curious paradox is that when I accept myself just as I am, then I can change. That acceptance is crucial. And so in a, a religious uh, framing, is it's curious paradox that when Jesus Christ accepts me just as I am, or when my parents accept me just as I am, then I can change. But this is this is the the, the paradox. This is the, the scary part is because we think, well, Kurt, no, no, no. Like if I show even a bit of acceptance, if I give an inch of acceptance, they'll take a mile of rebellion or a mile of going a, a totally different direction if they know that they'll they're accepted. You know, and this isn't about condoning sin or condoling any any negative behavior because sin will corrupt you. The point being is that it's the paradox. It's when you show acceptance, they simply are drawn towards you. When I feel complete acceptance from God and receive his grace, I can't help 
but turn to him and think, how do I become more like you? How do I spend more time with you? How can I develop into a creature that can receive more and more and more of this love? And that's when the rules come, the commandments, the covenants. Like, And they're not just rules for rules' sake. These are these are classrooms to develop as an indiv individual, to be in the presence of God and to be with him. Because there's no other place we want to be when we feel that acceptance. So yeah. have faith in that. Lean in as a parent and say, I, I mean, there's going to be clear boundaries. Boundaries are very healthy. There are certain rules to live in the home and whatever, but it's got to be, those have got to be delivered on a basis of acceptance and, and love. Yeah. And so when we set rules, we expect, if you want to have expectations, expect that they're going to be broken. You're right, right. And exactly. what are you going to do when they're broken is an increase of love, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this happened just the other day. We get a call from the principal right? That there was oh some sort of fist fight altercation. <laughs> and so I didn't even know about this. I get home and my husband's like, child, you, me, mom in mom's office right now, you know? And I'm like, yeah. I don't even know what he's in trouble about, you know, because the principal had talked to my husband and he didn't even tell me yet. Uh -huh. And so he's having his own experience and I'm just sitting there just baffled, you know, I'm like, what was he experiencing that led to that? You know, I was sitting there with like so much compassion and love and curiosity and not mad at all, which is also actually a fruit of believing that I'm a good mom. So it doesn't matter how my kids behave. I'm still good, you know, because a lot of times that's a layer in there. We're like, oh, no, my children are misbehaving. That's going to project badly on me. Right. But if yeah. we can cut that tie, then we can be more open to figuring out what was going on for him. And I just I mean, when I can, I'm certainly not anywhere close to perfect. So. A lot of times I do like the shame parenting automatically. And then later <laughs> yeah. with the repairs, I have to do more of the grace parenting. Right. But I yeah. just, I just let him know that no matter what, even if, especially when I love him, you know, and that's what I want him to know. Like of all the things I can teach him, I just want him to know that I love him even when he makes mistakes because kids take this on as shame so young. And yes. then we have to reprogram that later when we're old, you yeah. know, but like, <laughs> they have a natural guilt mechanism, right? Like when they do something bad, they feel bad. They don't need us to beat them up about it. They already feel bad. And so what they need is to know that they're loved and accepted, even when they do bad things, just like that's what we need from God. Yeah. And when we can believe that from God, then we can more easily give it to them. Yeah. And really seeking, seeking their heart before you seek their behaviors, right? We sometimes lead out in behaviors because that, uh, you know, that seems easier at times, but for, I, I, at the end of the day, I don't care if my son gets in a fist fight every day, as long as he'll talk to me about it. And yeah. and for me to approach him that way and say, Hey, listen, I don't, you could get in a fist fight every day and I'd still love you. I just want a relationship with you. I want to know like what happened? Like, why did you feel like you needed to fight somebody in order to, you know, survive at school? So let's talk about it, you know, and, and the more you can de-shame that and, and it's an acquired skill. It takes a lot of iterations and, and effort, but uh, we can get there. Like it's worth that journey. Yeah. And that's the whole point. It's supposed to be a journey. Yeah. It's not a destination. We're not perfect. So just real quick, cause I thought we'd be talking about identity and we kind of went off in a million directions. Yeah. We can go back there. Get there but, uh -huh. um, I actually just did an interview with my parenting coach because she got on this identity bandwagon. I'm like, yay, I love identity, you know, uh -huh. but, um, but we kept it very secular because it was for her podcast and she doesn't really talk about God on her podcast. Uh -huh. And so I was like, oh, sweet. I'll have Kurt. Now I can talk about God and Jesus yeah, and identity. Yeah. Right. Sure. And so it's just fun that like identity is even caught on in the, you know, more secular frame, because literally when you say I am. I feel like like that's taking the name of the Lord in vain. When I say mm -hmm. I am impatient, I am a bad mom. Like that's just a full on lie. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I have to watch myself and my thoughts when I'm going to use his title like that. I am. And then fill it with trash afterwards. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah the, so the identity framing is really powerful. And um, I'll give you sort of a, a framing that's often embraced that <clears throat> it's a little controversial that I actually disagree with it, but it may be for good discussion. So there's this um, this uh, quadrant that some a lot of leaders refer to, um, or uh, leaders and parents, that um, those who have high love, and high expectation is are in the ideal space, right? So yes, you want to give high love and high expectations, but this is simply a mechanism for uh, more and more shame because um, expectations are, um, they, they foster 
they foster shame because they foster disappointment. If there's an expectation, then there's a chance of there being disappointment. And so I replace that quadrant and say that the better approach to this is having high love and high identity. So yeah, there may be individuals who um, maybe they're not, you know, they're rebelling or they're breaking a commandment or they're sinning, whatever it is. And we want to approach them and say, hey, this we have an expectation. Like these commandments are expectations. Like, no, no, these these commandments are forms of revealing identity. And so in a parenting situation, if you can approach your child from a, a place of uh, of pursuing their identity rather than, like I said, pursuing their behavior, you're, you're in a better spot of de-shaming the situation and helping them actually progress by you reminding them. You know, even, you know, even from that young age, we remind them through songs that I am a child of God. Like, that's who you are. And, you, you know, obviously not in a, in a shame place, but just, again, reminding them of who who you see them as and who God sees them as. And then they'll begin to believe that. And once they believe that identity and absorb it, they naturally will behave in, in a different way. Now, this isn't some, I don't mean this as some manipulation strategy of like, well, just talking about their identity and ma magically the switch. Like, mm -hmm. like this is, this is reality. Like mm -hmm. they, they, they are so loved, so accepted because of who they are. Mm -hmm. And God, you know, I love our, our Latter-day Saint theology that, um, through, you know, the pinnacle of our, our religious experience on this earth is in, uh, are, is in, in temples where we are endowed from on high with an identity. And it's, that, I mean, that's what God does. He doesn't, he doesn't necessarily give us more commandments as much as he gives us more identity through covenants, right? That you're a covenant with me. You are more like me because of this covenant. So step into this covenant, stay in this covenant. And uh, that that's how people develop and grow rather than, you know, chasing the shame or running away from the, cha the shaming God. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's really interesting to watch because I have a daughter who just shame cycles so easily. Mm. As soon as she gets yelled at, she makes that mean she's, you know, the scum of the earth. And so she's just so <laughs> sad and crying, 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 you know? Yeah. And so then as I go and like try to make repairs and whatever, I always remind her, you are a hundred percent valuable, hundred percent worthy, hundred percent everything, you know, the things that I try to remind myself of when I'm in my shame cycles, you know, yeah. because it's just, it's just crazy what our brains make things mean. And so yeah. we gotta, yeah. And oftentimes it, it's, it's helpful to go to the name, right. And we, as, as you know, when you're expecting a child, you spend a lot of time with that name and there's usually a lot of purpose behind it. I mean, sometimes you'll give a first name that sounds cute or, you know, that, that maybe they'll live with, but maybe it's that middle name mm -hmm. that is maybe an ancestor, an individual. And, and for you to uh, point out attributes of that person, I'm often telling my nine-year-old son, like, you need to realize like you're, you are so strong. Like you are a strong individual and, and don't, don't believe that you're anything else because you are strong, right? So when yeah. you face these moments, you can know that you have a strength in you like a superhero. Rely on that strength. Go to that strength, right? And as he's hearing this, it's it's beginning to unwind the shame thinking, wait, am I really that? Do yeah. you believe I'm that? Like, yeah, look at my eyes. You can see how much I believe that you are that person, you know, and we named our son, his name's Taysom, and he thinks it's so cool that he's named after a former BYU quarterback who's now having a great NFL career. And he's got a poster in his wall. I'm like, you're Taysom Hill, man. Like, <laughs> look, you know, look at these highlights. Look at what, what he can do with that name. And you're just as strong with that name. And it, it, it makes a shift in their mind. Yeah. And then, of course, as our prophet told us that our three most important identities, yeah. <clears throat> child of God, child of the covenant, right? And then mm -hmm. a disciple of Christ. Yeah. So as we label ourselves with all the not so nice things all the time, you know, or even like identified by our career or things that we like or whatever, you know, we just have to remember that, yeah, those may be part of our identity, but the most important one that we need to, you know, identify with to change behaviors instead yeah. of focusing on behavior. Like, how do you say it? Live from your identity versus your behavior. Cause we like to be like, Oh, I yelled at my kids. Therefore I'm a yeller. Like yeah. we turn it into an identity. No, no, mm -hmm. I am a daughter of God. And therefore I'm going to, you know, behave like one. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Anyway. All right. Well, thanks so much, Kurt. Tell everybody where they can get the book because it's amazing. Well, thank you. Yeah, obviously Amazon is it's there uh, at the time of this recording. It's uh, popping up in Costco's. Um, so fun. And you know, church bookstores, it'll it'll be around. So uh, keep your eye out for it. But obviously, Amazon seems like I don't know. That's where I go for books. It right? Seems like everybody else goes for books. It's on Audible as well. Mm -hmm. I read every word of it. Um, 
and Kindle, you know, soft cover, whatever you need. And uh, yeah, I'd love to have you check it out. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it really just say for that individual who's just sort of overwhelmed with life, maybe overwhelmed with the, the church efforts and expectations and things like this may be a book to sit with and, and see if you can find a little more grace. Yeah. So good. And then I just remembered this is the fruit snacks podcast. So let's bring in a little <laughs> T1D mom stuff here. So um, when your child gets diagnosed with type one diabetes, especially if you don't know much about type one, then you probably are in quite the shame cycle about like, mm. I did this to my kid. This is my fault. And they try to tell you at the hospital that it's not, and you didn't and all the things, but <laughs> right. anyway, so we just deal with a lot of shame all day long, not just that diagnosis. Cause if you're watching their blood sugar, if you watch anyone's blood sugar, it'd be a roller coaster, but right. we actually do watch our kids and we're failing up here and we're failing down there and we're always mm. failing. So believing that we are a good mom, even when we're on the roller coaster of diabetes or just of motherhood, then it's, yeah. And knowing yeah. that we are good because God made us and we're good. And that's Amen. enough for me. So, yep. All right. Thanks, Kurt. Yeah. Thank you. See you on leading saints okay. <laughs> or I'll hear you. <laughs>